That was author David Petruja, really interesting fellow who writes about many different great historical characters. He did an earlier interview with him on Arnold Rothstein. That was quite amazing. And you are listening to Stribling's New York on WORAM Radio 710 on your digital dial. I'm your host, Rob Taub. We are joined here by Tony Simone, our producer in the studio. By the way, since the show is sponsored by Stribling and Associates, if you need to buy a home or apartment or rent one, contact Tony Simone, T-S-I-M-O-N-E at stribbling.com, and Tony will help you. And Tony, what is your, your blog address? It's TonySimone.com, very simple. My name is one.com. T-O-N-Y-S-I-M-O-N-E. And Tony, Simone like Nina Simone. <laughs> yeah, except Tony makes you happier. Nina Simone kind of makes me a little sad when I listen to those songs. Uh, I get a little mellow. Like a, I get the creepy weepy. So, oh, really? Uh, it makes yeah, me mellow. I, like, I cry. I've cried at a McDonald's commercial. You know, it's, it does it. Uh, we're joined by DC Vito, who is the executive director of The Lamp, learning about multimedia project. Welcome, DC. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So what does this what tell us about LAMP? The LAMP is a non The LAMP. The, yeah, the LAMP is the nonprofit organization based here in New York City and we teach media literacy to young people, parents and educators across the country. And we provide hands-on programming in the city by bringing the technology and and the curricula, but we also create technology and tools that allow us to reach beyond New York City. What is media literacy? What, I was going to say, what does that mean? Yeah, it's it's always a term that that needs to be explored. So this the, this day and age, we have young people between the ages of 8 and 18 consuming somewhere along 11 hours of entertainment media a day. The idea is literacy of reading and writing no longer is adequate. You need to understand media as well. That's back back in the 18th century when all there was was reading and writing made sense that that was what defined literacy. So media literacy in our version is understanding, we, we call it the three C's, so it's comprehending all forms of media, being able to create all forms of media, and ultimately, ultimately being able to be critical and challenge media. Like creating your own YouTube channel. Creating your own, your own, your I'm own YouTube. I'm still figuring that out, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but all, I mean, every, every, every young person is a producer themselves. They're right. constantly producing media. It's understanding what's behind that and the impact that, that media That's has. That's really on cool. How'd, how'd you come to LAMP? Like, how did you one day walk down and say, I'm going to teach kids media, media literacy? Well, the, the, I was working on a city council campaign in 2001 in Brooklyn, and I'm a Colorado native. And so I was a transplant. and Everybody back then knows 2001, the primary was 9-11. And all my family and friends were calling me saying, what can we do to help out? And I didn't have an answer. And, the, and the, we turned to our elected officials at the time, and both Mayor Bloomberg and President Bush were saying somewhat very similar things, which was, all you need to do is just reach into your pocket and spend money instead of taking on this idea that the the country was unified and saying, go and work in your communities and, and be a volunteer and go read books at your school. So that idea that boiling us down to essentially nothing more than consumers sort of troubled me. And I looked into it and noted that media have a tremendous role in shaping what we know about the world. And there are no organizations that are working in communities helping people understand. And this day and age now with the election, we can see that Media literacy is so important because of people not understanding what to believe, what right. sources are are accurate, what what is being manipulated for them. It's it's important. That's a good point. Because nowadays, I mean, I once I, my former life when I worked for Speaker Quinn and we worked closely with Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, he once called, and this is a non political show, but we can go with there a little bit. Yes, he um he would say, you know, when people twatter. It's he meant Twitter. It's annoying because they say something about me and everyone believes it. And it's a phenomenon that happens all the time now that I have relatives and family members who obviously have more time than I do who who obsess over social media. Did you hear what they said? Yeah. yeah. Did you hear what happened? And I imagine a kid growing up anywhere in New York City, since the show is focused on New York City, but New York and beyond, of course, we have great guests from everywhere. What how do how do people deal with that beyond being bullied but about how do they equip themselves one day right. 
I mean, brokers all the time, they tell us, get on social media, videotape yourself, videotape myself. Why? Right. Right. <laughs> right? So I guess it's a great thing that your organization is doing that for kids, right? Well, and Students, they, high school and college, just high school. It's K through 12. K through 12. Yeah. I knew that. Sorry. Well, what, what was it? Will Rogers once said, all I know is what I read in the papers. And it's 100% true. We look at social media and we may think that's true. As a journalist, I see how things are changing sometimes for the worst. Uh, when I worked for Time Incorporated, fact checking was just diligent and yep. uncompromising. Yep. And that really doesn't happen anymore. No. The, the, the cycle of news and the cycle that media it te- it tends to, to strive for doesn't permit that. And because they're also competing with all of us who are generating our own media. And without an understanding of the impact that that media that we're creating have, we're just throwing it out there. And so that's that's what we're really focusing on our young people is helping them understand both what it means to be a, a critical consumer, but also a responsible producer as well. Right. It is. We, I've never considered this. You're turning over like the means of this technology without any of the ethical lessons right. to a lot of today's youth. So yep. if you're supplying them that, then that's highly commendable. And where do where do I write a check? <laughs> <laughs> well, our our website is thelamp.org, and you can donate directly on our website. So, how how large is your organization? Where you're based out of here in New York City or Brooklyn? We're in New York City. We're over at Herald Square. So that's purposeful because we want to be near all the train stations because we carry the equipment all across the city. So laptops, video cameras, everything that's needed to create the media products. Mm-hmm. Because we feel like if you understand how they're constructed, you'll be able to deconstruct them. And we have six senior staff, and we have about 20 to 25 facilitators, and we serve about 900 students a year in New York City and all five boroughs. And then we also, with recent tools that we've developed, we also have reached beyond New York City and, and serving up to 10 states and around the country. So then do you see yourself growing exponentially? What's what's for the future? Yeah, we created a tool called Media Breaker with funding from the Knight Foundation and MacArthur, and it's the only of its kind online free video remixer. So it allows you to remix other people's video with the idea that you're going to learn how to do that responsibly. Hmm. And this tool is now a la- is is in 11 states currently, and it's in over 100 classrooms here in New York City. So they're re-editing commercials. They're re-editing news clips. They're they're talking back to music videos. So they're challenging some stereotypes in Beyonce or Kendrick Lamar, things like that, that they normally would just be asked to passively consume. Where do you find your students? Are they specific socioeconomic group in public schools? Yeah, so uh, we... 78% of our young people are young people of color, and we particularly focus on communities that need. Uh, that's just been that's just been a focus from the very beginning. And we work in schools. We work in all the library systems here in New York City, so New York, Queens, and, Bo- and Brooklyn. That's great. And we work with YMCAs and several settlement houses around, around the city as well. Because where does, does somebody go if they don't have access to a computer? Really, they're well, the public a library. library, but that's limited, I would think. So, yeah, we this we, is very necessary. Yeah, we do have some we have some public workshops that yeah. we've done at the at Brooklyn Public. You actually would probably like yeah. the, one of the workshops that we've done. Uh, we do a thing called a breakathon. So this is in its in its past, we did a break the the Super Bowl. Tony, you're familiar with this, where we actually have kids throw a Super Bowl party, but instead of just watching the game, we actually have them remixing the commercials that will be going up during the right. game, and they're challenging the commercials. So they're challenging the, cool. the, the stereotypes and the misleading representations, and we yeah. load them up live during the game. I like that. I only focus on the halftime show, but right. now I can focus <laughs> on something a little bit more, but if it's Madonna or something. So, so <laughs> this year, we've been really focused and really pushing Break the Election. Right. So we've done five events now here in New York City, public events, a couple at Brooklyn Public Library, where, where the students are actually remixing political ads, and they're trying to challenge, because political, That's fascinating. Ads, the political ads are horrible, and yeah. they're not offering any information or any policy prescriptions, right. and young people aren't learning from them. Right. And so we're, ask, we're actually asking them to, to reconfigure them with their own thoughts, and we, we publish those that 
at work. Well, speaking of Madonna, I've reinvented myself more times than she has probably, and I worked <laughs> extensively at one time. Your hair is different. I, yeah, I, I can't dance as well as she does either. I think I could sing pretty good. But she, uh, I'm not talking about Madonna, I'm talking about television production and editing, and I was a television producer, and I see stuff that's been heavily cut Especially on Twitter, people will post a video. Yeah. I've seen terrible things done with Obama's speeches. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah, uh, nowadays, yeah. We're probably going to get to a point at some someday where we're going to have a federal agency that's going to look at these things or something's going to be monitored. Monitored, I don't know. It's it's the kind of erroneous information that gets cranked out now that's taken as, as given because, yeah. you know, it, it's it's there, or as it's my there, grandmother so used it... to say, it says on the television. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, this has been a very interesting interview, and we're wrapping up now. Here Thank comes you, our DC. music. But Thank, Thank you, you yeah. DC, and feel, for joining to, us. Feel free to check us out. And give the, us the website one more time. Thelamp.org. Okay, thelamp.org. You've been listening to Stribblings New York. Go to our website, www.stribbling.com, or email Tony Simone, T-S-I-M-O-N-E, at stribbling.com. Good night. I'm Rob Taub. I'll see you next week. <laughs>